starting testimony this afternoon on H96. Um, we're continuing testimony we started this week, which is an act relating to creating a Truth and Reconciliation Commission Development Task Force. And we have two witnesses with us for the next half hour or so. Um, Mark Hughes, who is the Executive Director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and Reverend Christopher Cockrell from the Vermont Racial Justice Foundation. And we will start our um, testimony with Reverend Cockrell. And I believe we shared with you both whatever H96 is and the um, language that had been developed last year through the committee bill. And um, I'd just like to pass the microphone over to Reverend Cockrell. Welcome to the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. And are you, um, and, and you're muted, Reverend Cockrell, if you're there. There you go. All right, here I am. Here I there am. you are. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity and privilege to come before you today representing um, the Racial Justice Foundation and New Alpha Missionary Baptist Church. Um, we are here to talk about the, um, to developing a task force for HR 96. Um, we continue to call on the legislators to pass this bill and uh, not only just pass this bill, but to establish this task force to study and consider the apology and proposal for reparations for um, critical, um, critical slavery. Um, it's important that we ask the House Committee of Operations Committee to pass this um, with slavery reparations bill in it as well. We're believing that this will help promote um, a level of integrity in the state um, in promoting this, we will also, I believe, bring human, um, a humanity aspect to the state that is so much needed when it comes to dealing with people of color. Um, the, the, the need is well overdue, and we thank you for taking the head on this, but we believe that the committee, once it's in place, will be able to deal with a lot of the issues that have not yet been decided, and we hope and pray that the committee will consider our request. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Reverend. I appreciate it. Um, Mark Hughes. Um, and, and, and we'll have questions, I think, after Mark's statement, and, and we'll have a little back and forth um, in a bit. Welcome, Mark. Welcome to the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman uh, Stevens. And Good afternoon and happy Friday to the entire committee. I am Mark Hughes. I am the executive director of the Racial Justice Alliance and Justice for All. It is good to see you all. Um, rec I'm recognized in almost every face on here. Uh, so uh, good afternoon. <clears throat> I am here also to, um, to testify um, to uh, H1, H96, uh, H what is it? Is it 96? What's in front of us? 96? H96, yep. Yeah, I, I think I was talking about uh, 196 earlier or something like that. Anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, um, I appreciate the chair's uh, call. Uh, I think it was, I get my days blurred, but it was recent. And we had a conversation about this policy and uh, there is some history uh, that I've had with um, related policy. And, and uh, first of all, Regarding uh, H96 itself, you know, as I look at the short form, uh, as far as the intention of H96, I certainly have a deep appreciation and respect for the intent. I um, understand the direction uh, that this uh, policy is, is attempting to go with the ongoing conversation. Uh, of addressing uh, oppression uh, to various demographics of people. You know, we, have, we must address um, genocide. Uh, we, must, we must address uh, slavery. Uh, there, um, we must address our um, toxic masculinity, quite frankly. We must address uh, oppression in all forms. 
And so the concept of a, a truth and um, reconciliation approach uh, is not a new one. We know uh, the history of uh, South Africa and Desmond Tutu, uh, the work which was largely uh, successful, but controversial in, in some ways, um, bumpy, and there are various perspectives of the outcomes of that, depending on what you read. Um, and we also understand the approach of, and of restorative justice and restorative practices as they exist across our community justice centers and the work that has been done in, even in some of our schools. Um, um, and uh, uh, sometimes we, uh, some, sometimes these practices are, are implemented effectively and then sometimes uh, uh, ineffectively and sometimes inappropriately, uh, depending on the uh, particular subject matter situation at hand. So certainly respect and appreciate that. Um, now, historically, um, the perspective uh, that, uh, that I come to you from is, you know, as, as, an, as an organization, uh, that is uh, working uh, to um, ensure that uh, uh, American descendants of slavery uh, are thriving and are, and are safe uh, in our communities across the state. Certainly you could only imagine the, the perspective uh, that, um, that we would come to you from and it is not, uh, it's probably not without um, understanding also that um, it was the Racial Justice Alliance that introduced H-478 um, in house government operations last year, uh, which uh, remained on the wall the entire biennium. Um, <clears throat> I'll just note that H-478 was, um, was envisioned and it was crafted uh, as a result of a, a um, thorough research on uh, the work of the late John Conyers, uh, who introduced HR 40 in the United States House of Representatives uh, in 1989. It should also be noted uh, that since 1989, HR 40 has uh, been introduced every single year to the uh, to current date. And uh, that is um, about, as we can see about 32 or 33 years and has, um, has yet to be uh, released onto the floor for an up down vote. You know, just wanna note that uh, HR 40 um, is a policy that calls for the establishment of a, a task force. And, um, and that task force would simply be charged with conducting uh, research. Um, the task force would be uh, task, tasked with um, doing a deep dive, if you will, into gathering information uh, and uh, an, a, analyzing information and making determinations as to whether or not it would be appropriate uh, that the United States uh, would consider uh, certain proposals of reparations, if so would they would be. Um, many don't know, but the United States House of Representatives apologized for slavery in 2008. The United States Senate apologized for slavery in 2009 and um, I think the, the apologies were very similar, except for there was an exception clause in the 2009 Senate apology that made it very clear that there were no strings attached. <clears throat> so mind you on this timeline between 19, 19, 1989 and now, it seems that apologies have occurred on that continuum while at the same time, the reparations bill has never been taken up. So the reason why I make those points is, is, is really simple is, is that 
there was an apology that occurred in both chambers of the United States legislature, while at the same time, there was never a decision to just allow a task force to go and do the work to find out if reparations was appropriate and recommend how that would happen, if so. So in, in, in 2019, there was a policy, there was a bill introduced in the Vermont's government operations and the policy simply asked for a task force to examine the history of this state and to determine you know, if it was appropriate based upon the information that they gathered, whether or not an apology uh, would be um, offered. And if so, if there was recommendations for reparations, that, that same task force would bring those back to the legislature and make them, the legislature aware of that. So over the last two years, we could not find the political will within the government operations to just allow someone to go and examine the problem to determine whether or not an apology was appropriate. Consistent with the last 32 years in the United States legislature. Now, <clears throat> transparently, um, it's come to my attention that it was because of that and in conjunction with the difficulties that we were having in our government operations group, that the whole idea of um, truth and reconciliation even arose. In fact, um, it was problematic because, you know, obviously there is an indigenous American um, uh, evil that occurred in addition to the original sin. Um, and um, also there are political implications, which we understand well, um, because um, I know personally that legislators and even chairs have told me that the reason why this isn't moving is, is because of concerns about constituents' responses to this, because they were not ready for this yet. So I was told personally that this particular policy would be coming forward uh, and it would actually be considered by legislators in lieu of any, repair, any reparation proposal. And we were full aware, we being our steering committee and our board of directors, were full aware that this, what this policy was emerging at the time that we made the determination that we would yet again submit a request for a task force for reparations. So we did it quite intentionally with full knowledge of the work that you would be doing in this. Now, what does that mean? We believe these policies can coexist. I've been told by some elected officials, those who are white with political and economic power, that it has been decided or that there are deliberations at a minimum that are underway that, <clears throat> um, that would suggest that this is a better idea because what we wanna do is, is first we have to find truth and reconcile before such time as we um, consider uh, tasking anyone to do the work of collecting information to determine whether or not there should be an apology. <clears throat> so there's a couple of flaws that we see uh, with the rationale beyond the fact that, it, again, it's white people with political and economic power who's making these decisions, um, is, is that, um, first of all, it's, you know, it suggests that this makes it more convenient for you. 
it suggests that, you know, because if, if we can get all of the people that we heard together and take care of them in one tranche, then we don't have to deal with them separately. Um, well, from our perspective, the harm was inflicted separately. You had, these are separate initiatives. The other aspect of that, which is really practical is, is that as folks are healing, uh, sometimes, you know, even though it is our hope to come together because there's only one 1% at the end of the day, but it is our hope to be black, um, uh, indigenous uh, and people of color. The truth is, is that we are separate, that there are, there are different groups of us and we have different needs and we have different cultural uh, backgrounds, different histories, different challenges, different trauma, and so forth. And there are probably folks on this testimony who probably don't do well in group therapy. And I think what I'm really getting at here is, is sometimes it's better uh, to focus on oneself before one starts to expand that healing process. In fact, you know, in our practicality, uh, it's not just about healing, it's about empowering. And there's a lot of talk, especially amongst white people about intersectionality and so forth. But I think there's very little understanding about cultural empowerment that must happen in each one of these divided, in, in, in each one of these particular segments. Um, and I think that to suggest otherwise is, is probably nothing more than a venture of, of probably uh, group trauma voyeurism. <clears throat> so I think that, um, if this were to happen, this truth and reconciliation piece happened in conjunction, because at the end of the day, it's you who will decide. It doesn't really, I'm sure you're gonna consider what I'm saying, but at the end of the day, let's face it, you make the decision, you have the power. So if, if you do make this decision, I would say, obviously it would be important that this would be centered in, in black and brown, centered and directed in, with black and brown people. It doesn't look like that from, from what I've read. Uh, and um, so that, that's really super, super duper important is, is just how do we center this kind of work in black and brown? Now, I'm not suggesting that this bill as it emerges and it's probably gonna drop any minute now um, on reparations that, that we're not interested in that. In fact, I hope you consider it in your committee. Um, I, in fact, I wonder if maybe it might have more potential because the question is, is not whether uh, six out of 11 or seven, you'd never, you'd never pass anything six out of 11, but let's just say 10 out of, 10 out of 11 folks passed it, nine out of 11 folks pass it out of here. Um, that's, let me just back up from that. That is really the, the largest concern because what, what, what I think what I believe is, is that the vast majority of 180 people would, would vote for it. Which is why, you know, this whole process is, is problematic. Um, so yeah, so I do believe that center, centering this in black and brown folks is, you know, in, in directing is important. Um, and I also believe that the, um, you know, based upon what I've seen of this, this work as it, it goes forward, um, that it's important that you take into consideration that there, there will be, um, initiatives that you will need to endeavor that are going to be unique to uh, various demographics, such as, you know, um, indigenous Americans, for example, um, uh, such as, you know, fill in the blank. Um, I think those folks who uh, have been historically impacted um, by um, um, the institution of slavery, um, I, you know, I, there, you know, there are reams of data from the United Nations um, Human Rights Commission um, who accurately refer to this as a crime against humanity and um, have um, historically have for uh, decades called on the United States of America uh, to apologize for the heinous crime of slavery and, and also to move forward with reparations, specifically calling out HR 40, by the way. 
So and I'll, I'll include with I'll conclude with this because I got to get out of here. But um, and I do appreciate the time to come over and, and chat. And I want to give a couple of minutes to to answer questions. But um, as a result of our work, the city of Burlington has implemented a reparations task force. A reparations task force has been in full play for probably about 60, 90 days. Their work will be complete at the end of this year. The sky did not fall. The buildings are not burning down. There's nobody fighting in the streets. This task force, from my research, there is not one like it in the nation. Not one. We're doing it, we're gonna get it done, it's possible. I implore you to take it up and move it forward. If H96 is a thing that you wanna do, center it and direct it with black and brown folks. Don't use it in lieu of a reparations task force. I'll take your questions. Thank you, Mark, for your words. Do we have questions for Mark right now? Can you tell me, um, Mark, on the Burlington task force, um, are those meetings public? I mean, Every some of us one. don't live in Chittenden County, so I may, I may represent a small piece of Chittenden County, but I don't live there, so I'm not sure what the, what the process is and, and how the hearings are held. Yes, so this is a city initiative, you know, and these are public dollars. So every single meeting is public and it's, it's, they're all announced and, and, and they're also, um, they're also on YouTube, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Um, Representative Bloomley. Thank you, um, Mark. Hello. Uh, hello. <clears throat> um, I'm wondering if you can be a little more specific. So I just wanna make sure I understand what you're saying about centering black and brown people. Um, they're the original author, the, the original bill um, was, uh, I think focused more on um, those who had been particular targets of, um, and there was a broader cross section of folks, um, those who had been targets of um, the eugenics project. And so I'm wondering, are you, I will, and you said harm was inflicted separately, which implied to me um, a, um, a vision for a truth and reconciliation process that really addressed different issues in different communities. Um, well, the, I think for the first part of that conversation is, is that um, a good way to start by uh, centering and um, direct and, and placing out the direction, uh, you know, Black and brown folks is is you know let it be their idea. Um, that's a great place to start. This this didn't come out of our community. This didn't come out of anybody's community. This came from you. So um that's a great place to start. And then at a minimum, um, you know, allow them to be. I take that back. We're we're so uh, paralyzed by this false narrative of white supremacy. But um, I think that. It should be your desire to collaborate with black and brown folks to create something like this and enable them uh, to direct it, to produce the results that are most important to them. Does that help? Um, it, it does. And, and I'm wondering Good. then what the legislation would look like because given given where this session is right now yeah. um and um if there is a process that you have in mind that would be 
Well, no, I actually, respectfully, I, I don't. Um, because, because again, you know, we wrote a reparations bill. Uh, that's what we're asking for. Uh, this is your bill. So I, I think that, um, you know, respectfully, um, the, the, you know, the solutions that black and brown people put forward, um, if you're looking, I'm, I welcome the uh, invitation for advice. So here's the advice I would give you. Listen to black and brown people. Well, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I, and I think that this is a, um, any rate, I, I don't, I guess I don't have any more questions right now, um, but may later, Mark. Thank you. Yeah, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, and um, I see you're in Burlington too, so we can do it over coffee. Hey, Representative Parsons, and I want to be conscious that Mark needs to go to another meeting right now. But 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 Representative Parsons, go ahead. Yeah, it'll be quick. Um, just a correction: my name's not on this bill. This is not my bill. It was in my short form. So when you say this mm -hmm. is yours, you uh, not me. So I'm in this committee. It was not my bill. Just clarification. Thank you for that clarification. And um, before I apologize, can I also get additional clarification? Is yeah, this a you need to bill? apologize. I just, it's fine. I'm just letting you know. I'm, I'm, I'm new to this committee and I've never met, met you before. So it's possible that maybe one of the names on there you thought was mine. So perfectly fine. Well, <clears throat> well transparently, I, I, I didn't take the time to match the name on this the names on this bill up to everybody on this call. Um, but the question that I was gonna ask is, is, is this a committee bill? So right now, the draft that you have that we shared with you, draft 20905 mm -hmm. was dated last year. So this was the committee that, this was started by the committee that was serving last year as a committee so bill. So this is a committee was, bill. Which was not me. No, this, this is a draft. Mm -hmm of a bill that hadn't gotten mm -hmm. out of committee mm -hmm. that had started with the conversation with the eugenics survey apology last year. And so this is, so H96, which is this year's bill was sponsored by representative Colston and representative Christie and myself. And, mm -hmm. um, and because it was a short form bill, we, we knew we were gonna come back to this draft language, which was um, not completed work. I mean, the, the, the draft language that was in this bill came out of the eugenics conversation, eugenics survey conversation, and it was only later on in the process uh, prior to us leaving the state house on the March 13th that um, it, was, it was a few days before then that we took testimony for the first time of including um, uh, black and brown people, to use your words, um, in it, and that that concept was not fully shaped yet because we hadn't worked okay. on it. <clears throat> so, ju so just uh, to to Senator Parsons' point, though, and, and just for a further clear for, uh, for Representative Parsons, uh, for just so I can walk away from this committee having learned something, um, because maybe I made an invalid assumption, um, was the genesis of this bill last year. A, a committee, was it the intention that it would be a committee bill or was it introduced to this committee otherwise last year? I wasn't here last year. This is my first year as a representative. Representative Parsons, I know exactly you weren't here last year, but I just wanted to, I'm okay. just trying to get so, one question in. I know exactly, I know you showed up and your name's not on the bill, but back okay. to the question. I was, I, I'm just saying I never do anything to do with the draft. Got you, got well, it all figured out. I, I just want to understand what was going on in this committee last year. Gotcha. So last year we heard testimony again because we were focused on JRH seven, which was which was a um, proposal to do an apology for the eugenics survey and the cause and the uh, damages it caused the affected communities, which were identified in that bill as as being um, indigenous Vermonters, uh, Vermonters with disabilities, French Canadian community, people who were targeted in the eugenics survey. 
So, and uh, one of Mr. the Chairman, things that came can just that, just 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 for because I got it. I got really got to go. And I just I really I, all I wanted to understand is, is what is the origin of the draft document, not H96, but your your staffer, your uh, admin and you promised you promised you'd send this over to me when we spoke. What is the origin of this 311 document 2020? I just want to understand, did the committee create this or was or did this come out from someplace else? This came out of the conversations that we had with the affected communities when we were discussing the apology. So yes, we started the bill. We Thank started you. the process of the bill when we after we were talking to um, mm -hmm. the folks who were affected in the apology. Thank you. All right. So Representative Parsons, now this is your committee. <clears throat> so thank you so much for your time today. Uh, and I've got to get off to another uh, meeting. And I appreciate, I really appreciate it. And I'm glad to come back and answer any other questions. Have a great weekend. Right. Thank you, Mr. Hughes. And thank you, Reverend Cockrell. And Lisa, we'll hold off on that for now. Okay. Okay. Um, I I just had a question for you, Mr. Chair, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. about that draft, where we can find it, because I can't find it anywhere. And I certainly can't remember from a year ago what it said. Um, it's under, Damien, if you go to the H96 page, I believe that we posted it as the 2020. Um, it's under, it should be under Damien on, on the H96 page. If, if you click on the H96 button under bills, all the documents will come up and that one is listed twice actually with slightly different titles. There's two different drafts, an older one and a more recent one. I'm gonna ask you to walk me through it because I, I apologize. I have looked and cannot find it. So if you go to our committee page yep. and you click on bill. bill. Yep and you click on uh, H96. Um, sorry. Got it. And then you click on drafts and amendments. Ah. Okay, and I'm seeing 2021 dates. So which one? The, the, but the, the title of the bill says from 2020. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. That was a convoluted way of finding it, but I have it now. I'll bookmark yeah. that. Thank just, you. Just to be clear, the most recent version of that document is the one from uh, February 24th. We're referring to the draft from last session. Um, yep, which that's was the most recent draft from last session. And that is posted under February 24th and the drafts there. Of for H96. Yeah, so February 24, 2021 has okay. the H96 TRC draft bill from 2020. And Got that it. is the most recent one from 2020. If you wanted to see the, the language that was added after we'd been through one draft. Okay, that's great because I do see at the end it says from 2020 Damian Leonard, but two of them said from 2020. So thank you for yeah. clarifying that. And Mr. Chair, is that the one that our witness had in his possession? I believe that's what we sent them. Is that not right, Ron? Yeah. Yes, that is correct. We sent okay. him the uh, the version 1.2 or whatever the correct number is. This one is 2.2 that Damien just pointed us. 2.2. 2. Yes, okay. and he did he did mention that he was looking at the draft from 311 um, 2020. Perfect. So thank you. This this was where we this was this was created after um, uh, Representative Hango, if you if you recall, after Representative Copeland had testified to our committee because they weren't going to get to age 478. And so there was a thought of marrying the two concepts together because they were seeking, at least in theory or in concept, they were seeking the same thing. But our conversations didn't go any further than March 11th because 
I believe that afternoon was when the speaker said, drop what you're doing and focus on the pandemic. So um, that's where we ended up with this bill. Okay, great, thank you. So it does incorporate her testimony, the ideas from her testimony in it. So stuff, when you get to it and see it, you'll see a lot of highlighted material. Yep. And it. again, and then it was all about the bracketing is something that I use as shorthand in this kind of work as drafting. Like if you bracket it, it's not, it's not real yet. It's just sort of there for discussion. Yep, okay, so one last question then. How is this relating to H96 of this year? Um, are you intending that the, the, the two will meld into an H96 that would pass out of this committee? Um, the intent was to say, you know, because we ended this draft in such a, unlike JRH7, which was not complete, but had had substantial mm -hmm. testimony, um, Unlike that bill, this one had a lot of new language in it. And so when we were considering moving this forward to this year to, to be the companion bill to JRA, what's now JRH2, um, Representative Colson came forward and, and just started, and, and Representative Christie and the conversations that we had, we were very uncomfortable with taking this language and plugging it into what is now H96. And then with the, with the, um, emphasis on saying, hey, try using a short form. It was decided to use the short form to put the proposal of what the purpose of the bill would be with an understanding that this may be a starting draft. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So thank you everybody for that change, Tommy. I've just got to say this, Chair, a number of us on this call are active in the Social Equity Caucus, and I want to assure you that when that caucus discusses the resolution and H96, both the content and the tone are very different from what we just experienced. Okay, thank you. Representative Murphy. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I appreciate um, Representative Hango's um, persistence of, of getting clarification. I, I think maybe I would have had a little more understanding of, of the conversation we just participated in if I'd known um, what testimony, what had been given for the, for the individual to give us testimony back on, because I was looking at H96 short form, not really understanding where some of the concerns were coming from. And so I'm I'm sorry there was so much um, confusion um, and, and I'm sympathetic with Representative Parsons too, who was kind of saying, it's not my bill. It's because we just, it, it was unfortunate. Um, I think there's a little miscommunication that happened and, and hopefully we, none of us hold anything from that. We can just keep going with our work. Um, no, I appreciate that. I, I think that, um, you know, one of the interesting things about this process thus far is, first of all, is to always retain um, a sensitivity to the work that we're doing. And, um, and, and to who we're doing it with and for. And so, you know, but also remembering that these are incredibly sensitive issues for people and the need to retain a voice and the, re the you know, the, the to take the voices out of the social equity caucus and start bringing them into legislation and start bringing them into the world is still, um, you know, I am always going to make mistakes myself. I'll speak for myself and I'm always going to get defensive at times when somebody criticizes my work. Um, but in this particular case, um, which doesn't apply solely to this bill, <laughs> but it really applies to much of our work is that how much, how important communication is and how important it is to think that, well, I, you know, oh my, we worked on this bill all last year and then we worked on this bill just a little bit. Everybody should know what we're doing. And that's just not really a good assumption to make. Um, that's not, you know, that that's just not a good assumption to make. And so, um, you know, I'll endeavor to keep doing, you know, my work and speaking truth to what we're doing. 
with that. Um, I did have a conversation with Mr. Hughes on, I believe it was yesterday. As he said, time kinds of, you know, when was time? Um, but building those relationships and those bridges are, it's not, it's not a simple thing. So, you know, how, for the, for those of you who go to the social equity caucus, um, you know, and, and, uh, you know, make an opportunity and, and to make sure we're clear about what we're trying to do and, um, just keep working. Yeah. Any further comments to close the conversation on 96?